lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixon. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. Yeah. How about you? Oh, I'm surviving. Yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> well, Come, coming off a big libertarian convention. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so what, my, so my what, biggest disappointment is that we didn't uh, get to check out more of the local restaurants. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Wow. I, I enjoyed the convention. Actually, I enjoyed it through and through. Um, the business was always kind of what you expect, you know. Mm. A lot of, <laughs> I don't know, a lot of tedious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, And I got to thinking the other day, I was one, like, so do the Republican and Democrat Party, when they have their convention... Do they go through all of this like minutia over bylaws like we do? Oh, I doubt it. Um, I suspect that that's decided like much higher up. Yeah, I don't know. I just got to thinking about. It. I was like, man, like like we spend so much time on that. They actually probably do that with their their state executive committees instead of doing it with the with the, the con- with party the, convention. With the party yeah. convention. Yeah. I don't know. Just something that crossed my mind the other day. It's like, man, like thinking back on the, like after we had gotten home and everything, like thinking back on the, the convention, mm-hmm. I was like, man, you know, we just spend a lot of time on that. And it yeah. seems like that time could be focused somewhere else. Yeah. Like what? I, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> I just feel like it's, I don't know. It's a, a, a lot to it, but I enjoyed all of that. Like even, even all of that part, like wasn't, I don't know. It, it, it was an interesting convention, I thought. Mm-hmm. It it definitely had a feel and a theme to it this year that other conventions haven't. Okay. And of all of the conventions I've been to, I would say this was probably my favorite. Yeah. Um. Actually, no, probably. It was absolutely my favorite because Afro Man performed, and that was just amazing. <laughs> okay. But... um. But but even beyond that, like it it felt like there was more energy, like the whole way mm-hmm. through, like the whole convention felt like there was an energy there that I hadn't really seen at the. Uh, I mean, to some extent at the other conventions, but not like this. This one had a distinct feeling for me. Um, I don't know how you feel if you felt that or not. Um, I don't know, maybe not so much. I guess. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. Um. I thought it was the. I thought the schedule was strange. Um, now there were some scheduling f- problems, and well, like you didn't, you didn't go the Afro man. Like there was some real scheduling problems that like prior to the concert and stuff. Like just some poor decisions. Yeah, scheduling wise. Well, th- what I saw is that they had um, is like they were interspersing the political stuff with the entertainment stuff. Yeah. Um. So it would be like. Uh, a performer and then uh, somebody running for office giving a speech and then a mm-hmm. performer and somebody, and maybe that's normal, but it just seemed weird. Yeah. Um, well, and, and I think the thinking behind that was like, we'll, we'll kind of keep everybody entertained and keep people involved with the mm-hmm. entertainment and then have the other stuff there too. Yeah. But, well, the, but you're two, right though. Like it yeah. created a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were two things with that one, the, they had to change venue at the last moment um, yeah. because the the city venue that they were going to use kind of screwed them over. Yeah. Um, and so uh, they switched to a private venue and I don't know, I, everything was planned, I'm sure, with the, the city venue in mind. And then they had to um, adjust it to new setting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so that that's... You know that's tough anyway. That was probably a factor in some of the, um, some of that. The other thing is I don't know that we've that the party has done this before, but um, like everything was open to the like they were selling tickets to the entertainment stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, you know, if you you know if, if you're trying to draw people in, like if you're if you're making it open to non libertarians. And you want them to maybe explore this a little bit. It makes sense to throw somebody that's running for office, in. like somebody who's talking yeah. about libertarianism in as well as the entertainment. Absolutely. Right? So yeah. um, in that sense, it, it made sense too. It was just, it was just and, strange. And that part <laughs> actually worked out pretty well for um, before prior to Afro man, when we got there, mm-hmm. because um 
Spike Cohen spoke. And so, and they had, I missed a bunch of stuff because Afro Man got there and then everything was running super behind, mm-hmm. which you would expect. Yeah. And um, so like Afro Man got there and did the, like, did his like initial, like I'm here. And mm-hmm. then like he went and hung out in the hallway after that. And so like, I went and hung out in the hallway with Afro Man okay. <laughs> for like an hour before he performed. But, um, but what was neat though, is kind of prior to some of that, like people had started showing up and everything for Afro Man and the um, comedian who um, spoke. And, but all of those people got to hear Spike Cohen speak. Yeah. Like, and Spike Cohen got up there and done a very passionate speech about all kinds of stuff that people who aren't exposed to this message got to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I thought that was good. It was really smart. Yeah. Um, it, there were some issues with some, like the timing on some of it could have been better, but, mm-hmm. but I do think that that was the right idea. Yeah. Well, the thing that occurred that I was happiest about at the convention was that we made it easier to become a county affiliate. Yeah. And I, that's, uh, bringing it down to just the legal requirements and yeah. nothing extra as yeah. far as, um, what we require as libertarians. Yeah. Essentially, if you get two people in a County that want to form an affiliate and they're willing to be officers, then that's enough. Yeah. Um, where it used to, it used to require twice as many and that, the whole thing to people who aren't, um, who don't do a lot of interaction with third parties probably sounds like that's ridiculous, but like the difference between having two people willing to put time in to, for free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and four people willing to put time in for free for a third party, as particularly in a state like Alabama, is big. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it, it can, that really may pay off in the coming years, having where it only takes a couple of people to get active. Yeah. Like that could be, that could be big as far as like trying to get signatures and, mm-hmm. and just some of the, like the groundwork stuff that has to be done. Yeah. And just being visible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, there, uh, like I wear, uh, I have a Libertarian Party of Alabama shirt that I wear from time to time. I've had people ask me if it was a joke. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Like, no, yeah. this is and a, it ain't funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is a real thing. It's yeah. like, oh, that that exists. Yeah, that exists. There, yeah. there is more than Republican. Well, and, and I've had, occasionally Democrat in Alabama. I've I've had conversations uh, like for years now with just different people, and when I mention the fact that I'm a libertarian, they're like, mm-hmm. "Oh, like a liberal?" Like, no, yeah. <laughs> like the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. In many respects. Well, by today's definitions, yeah, probably yeah. true. But, um, um, the uh, the other thing, um, and this uh, this can kind of transition us into our our main topic here yeah. um, is that I, I did get to speak for a little bit with a guy from Georgia who's running for house. Yeah. Um, and he's running for, Oh gosh, what was the name of that guy? Oh, well forget it then. Anyway, yeah. um, he, uh, after he gave his speech where he, you know, he talked about himself as the, as an anti-war candidate and, um, that, uh, he, you know, got up there and condemned Russia for what's going on in Ukraine, um, and, um, said we need to support the Ukrainians, et cetera. And, uh, and gave a speech where he talked about a bunch of other things too. Uh, Actually, after talking about him, one of his big things is immigration, um, which was kind of interesting. But after a speech, I, I, um, came over and sat down by him and I was like, Hey, you know, look, I didn't want to derail your speech or anything, but like, can we talk for a minute about this? And he's like, yeah, I got sure. some things to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have some criticism. Yeah. Um, and uh, I said, uh, you know, you talk about supporting Ukraine, but what about for the last eight years while we've been supporting Ukraine and their, and their attacks on these breakaway provinces in the Donbass? Yeah. Like, we were supporting Ukraine then. Were you speaking out against that? Yeah. You know, um, and uh, it, long story short... I mean, we, we're in the same place and, um, he said, yeah, but you know, right now Russia is the aggressor. And I I said, yeah, but if you just get up there and you talk, this was on Saturday. So I was like, if you get up there and you present this thing, like history began three days ago, you just sound like the mainstream media. You're, you're giving a message that everybody hears. And it's not, I I don't think it's it's effective in the long run. If you want to be an anti-war candidate, because one of the things you can't just go up there and say, Oh, terrible, evil Russian empire, et cetera, to be the anti-war candidate. 
especially as a libertarian, you need to get up there and talk about the, the actions of the United States foreign policy establishment over the last 20 years that well, led here. <laughs> and that's something that Ron Paul was always really good at mm -hmm. is, is go is educating people on that history because mm -hmm. the mainstream media, you're not going to get any of that from. Yeah. Um, and people are hungry for that type of information. Like, I mean, because your average person doesn't know all the history that's, that's went on in the background mm -hmm. for all these years. They just know what they're being told right now. Yeah. Um, and so to be that candidate that's putting that information out there can be good for your campaign. Mm -hmm. Like it, because it, it, it pulls people in. It's like, oh man, this guy's saying something that nobody else is. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I, I, I said, especially when you're talking to non-libertarians, like you got a room full of people that probably a lot of them know. Yeah. Know yeah. the history here, like know the score. Yeah. Um, when you're talking to non-libertarians, like you're probably going to upset some of them, but yeah. it makes a difference when they're like, oh, that's BS, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to go home and look that up. That's stupid. I can't believe he said we were doing that. Yeah. And then they get on the internet and they start hunting around. And they're like, huh. Well, <laughs> all of a sudden they're down the rabbit hole that you sent them on. Yeah. You know? um, and it may bring them over to your side. Absolutely. And it, and it will upset people because I, I will go ahead and respond now to some people on our last podcast. Yeah. I am not endorsing or advocating what Russia is doing in Ukraine. In what no I'm way. trying yeah. to what I'm trying to establish is why. Yeah. Because it's important to establish why if you want to avoid this kind of thing in the future. And if you want to avoid this kind of thing in the future, you should probably avoid some of the provocations and, and uh, condescensions um, that we've directed towards Russia for the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, otherwise, this will just keep happening. Yeah. And it's uh, the deal with Russia in particular right now. And Russia is obviously the clear aggressor here. Like they, mm -hmm. they shouldn't be doing what I know we're going to dig a little deeper. Yeah. But I mean, there's no good reason for them to be doing, but to, I say no good reason, but they've been, it's, put, not, they've, justifiable. They've, it's not justifiable. That's yeah. a good way to put it because, because there is reason they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, Oh, well they've decided they're going to reinstate the Soviet union. Like that's, yeah. that's not what's happening here. But you wouldn't get that listening to your mainstream media. Yeah. And all sides are lying here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like every side is lying here. Just to take a couple of examples. Um, okay. And this one I think is really dangerous. Putin is not insane. No, he's very calculated. Yeah. Um, this guy has shown nothing in his career if not being cold and calculating about his decision making. Yeah. Um, it is really dangerous to underestimate him and and consider him insane. There is there is reason, it, like there is rationale to the decisions that he's made. Um, two, something on the Russian side, the Ukrainian government is not a Nazi government. Yeah. All right. The U.S. did enlist Nazi groups to help overthrow the previous government. Yeah. Um, in 2014. But yeah. the government itself is not a Nazi government. Yeah. Um, and Zelensky, uh, it, it, Zelensky is a Jew whose family fought on the side of the Russians who, you know, uh, somehow his family was, um, was affected by the Holocaust, et cetera. Like th yeah. these are things that people say about him to say, well, it's not a Nazi government. You're yeah. right. It's not a Nazi government, but this is also a guy who, uh, was very popularly elected, like almost three quarters of the population voted for this guy. Yeah. And he came in as the peace candidate. Yeah. Talking about detente with Russia. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's not what he's done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he is not popular now. Yeah. I mean, he became more popular once when, the when war they got attacked, broke yeah, out, but, yeah. um, but he's not popular now or he wasn't popular. Not going as popular into as he was when he was elected, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, and is that the reason why I probably partially, I yeah. mean, that's certainly how it works in this country. Well, and I'll tell you <laughs> one more thing too, about the, the whole, um, Putin's crazy, this whole, that whole narrative, mm -hmm. um, that's always the narrative because yeah. it was the same way with um, Saddam Hussein, Saddam, all of them. Like uh, you go down, Omar Gaddafi, yeah. You start exactly. going down the list, the Ayatollahs in Iran. Mm -hmm. Like it's all there are these crazy people who don't know what they're doing, and they're going to blow the world up. Like yeah. 
I mean, then that's that's never the case. Like these people, I mean, and say what you will about Saddam and all the rest of them, but they were looking after their own self-interest. Yeah. And imagine if you were on the other side of this, what you could be saying about Joe Biden. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't even think about that, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. Like, yeah. I mean. <laughs> and they so, almost certainly are. Almost certainly. Yeah. And, and here's another thing that I, I heard. I was uh, watching France 24. And um, they were interviewing this lady uh, living in Moscow, a, a dissident in Moscow. And uh, she kept saying, um, well, I can't call it a war. It's a special military operation. You know, it, you know, war, I, I can't call it a war because they've said it's a special military operation and I could face 15 years in prison, et cetera. Yeah. Well, then I switched over to RT. Yeah. And the Chiron is war in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> really? All right. So if Russian state television is calling it a war, yeah. See, why can't this lady? I saw and the reason that she can't call it a war is because it's it's a story that she's telling to to um, you the know, Western media. Yeah, to Western media to like criminalize Putin, talk about his authoritarian regime. And yeah. it's not to say that his regime isn't somewhat authoritarian. Yeah. But that part's not true. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, because I heard that same thing reported multiple sources. I can't remember where all I, I consumed a ton of news yesterday. Yeah. So um, I couldn't tell you where, but over and over again, I heard that the 15 years for for calling it a war. Yeah. Like that was all over mainstream media. Yeah. Um, and of course, the you know, the a bunch of places have blocked RT. Yeah. Um, and I, I can't even start to describe how ridiculous that is. Yeah. Uh, and... What they're doing is they're saying, you're not allowed to hear an alternate opinion. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to be insulted by it, then it's really easy because you can also make the assumption that the reason they don't want you to hear an alternate opinion is because they th they think you're too stupid to come to the to the conclusion that they want. Yeah. Well, and it, it they once again, something that, that government, it, it's just a nature of theirs because it's the same way with the COVID stuff mm -hmm. where they want to shut down the other side. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly what this is, mm -hmm. um, is, is don't want you to hear the other side. Yeah. Um, and, and it's more than that. Like, okay, so they shut down RT. Uh, then of course, uh, Sergey Lavrov was supposed to speak at the UN. Yeah. They wouldn't allow him into the country to speak at the UN. He had to do it by video. And mm. then a whole bunch of people boycotted the speech. Yeah. Now, if you're trying to make the case that you want to come to a peaceful conclusion and you want negotiations on this, then boycotting the the presentation of the other side's chief diplomat is yeah. probably not the way to do it. Yeah. Um, and it, it suggests to me that the the West isn't interested in a diplomatic conclusion to this. Well, I don't want to go all conspiracy, but I I think this is exactly what the West wanted. I think it's somehow, and I don't know what the end game here is or what, what the plan would be, but I've seen no indications that this isn't exactly what we wanted. Well, um, I remember commenting to you while we were at the, at the convention uh, when I was watching news Saturday morning or Sunday morning or whatever. Oh, mm -hmm. I guess it was Sunday because we were talking about it on the way back. Oh, yeah. Um, and I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to this guy, Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, from Ukraine, and he seems genuinely surprised that NATO hasn't come to help. Yeah. Um, and, uh, of course they are willing to sell weapons to him. That's, oh, yeah. the, you know, that's <laughs> no yeah. problem there. Even, um, oh, and this is, well, don't let me forget to come back to Switzerland. Okay. Because I think that that's really interesting this is too. Important. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, Germany's selling weapons, uh, Great Britain's selling weapons, the U S is selling weapons. Like everybody's selling weapons to him yeah. though. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and you know, it seems like that they would want to kind of maintain some level of neutrality in this. If yeah. anyway, that's beside the point. Um, the the point that I was trying to make is that he seemed genuinely surprised that NATO hadn't come to help him, that they hadn't come rushing in with their armies to to fight off the Russian hordes yeah. with him, and um, and it's like he didn't realize that that he was being had the whole time, that yeah. he was just a pawn. 
that the whole dangling Ukraine out as a NATO member was never, they were never intended never to serious. make them yeah. a, a NATO member. Yeah, that, because like, that was my reaction when you told me that, because I was like, dude, there's no way he seriously believed that that was on the table. Hey, he didn't come from politics. He came from entertainment. Yeah, I, and I guess you're right, but at the same time, like, I mean, the fact that he couldn't see that coming is just astonishing to me. <laughs> yeah. And to your point, the whole thing about making Ukraine a NATO member was yeah. all just to antagonize Russia. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's all <laughs> that's this whole point. Which, and that's all this was. And I, I don't understand. I don't understand what the end game here is, mm -hmm. but it just feels like this is exactly what we wanted. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't I don't think that they ever thought Russia would actually do anything. Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, back to, so, and I, I admit that I am certainly being influenced in my assessment of this by the book I'm reading, which is Perils of Dominance by Gareth Porter, oh, yeah. uh, where he's talking about the, the, the difference in um, military power and economic power yeah. uh, leading up to Vietnam. The, yeah. the U.S., um, after about 1953, um, the U.S., China and Russia were all well aware that the U S was way above them in military capabilities and economic power. Yeah. Um, and so the result of that was that Russia and China were both being conciliatory about what was going on in Southeast Asia. And the U S was pressing their advantage because they didn't, because they, because could. they couldn't be challenged. Yeah. And I, it's the same thing here. Yeah. Um, the U.S. and and it's been clear since the fall of the Soviet Union, like so much more clear since the fall of the Soviet Union, where we had that monopolar period where there was only one great power in the world, and that was the United States. Yeah. And the United States has taken strong advantage of that, going and getting involved all over the world, everywhere yeah. where they wouldn't have before if they could have been challenged, but they knew they couldn't be, yeah. and so they did whatever they wanted. Yeah. Um, and that's how we got here. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Well, and, I don't and, and you've made Putin feel like um, after the Soviet Union collapsed and they allowed all these satellite states to become their own independent states. Yeah. And what he's saying about Ukraine, if you listen to his speeches, is he's he's saying if you what the U.S. has shown me is that if Ukraine isn't ours, it's theirs. It's theirs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's absolutely the problem here. Mm -hmm. And and we're not even being bashful about it. Like, no. I mean, and, and that's the that's what the other part that just kills me is that like we're so out in the open, just openly antagonizing them. Yeah, uh, it just it doesn't. I don't know. It, it just seems it just feels dangerous. Well, it, it is. But it's because I think that our government doesn't feel like anybody will challenge them. Putin's yeah. proven them wrong right now. Well, um, because he he there's also the recognition that these are major nuclear states. Well, yeah, we can't so we, we can't, can't come really, into direct combat. Yeah, um, and and there is that clear understanding, thank mm -hmm. God, yeah. that that we can't actually engage them on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, at least so far, that's at, been at the, least so far that's been the case, right? Um, but um, I mean, Pl Putin's already flirted with the idea of you know readying his his stuff. Well, he's made it very clear, yeah, that that he's you know stepped up the alertness or whatever of their yeah. um, nuclear. Uh, arsenal. I mean, after watching some of their tanks and stuff, I question how well those things will work. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want to press our luck with it. I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, so, something that's interesting going on here, and again, it's about getting that support from the West. Yeah. Um, is that after the first like two days or something of this, uh, Zelensky was saying, "Hey, I'm ready to talk. We're ready to consider neutrality, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And then yeah. all these Western nations started stepping up and offering arms, yeah. and so. Zelensky had already agreed to talks with the U with uh, Russia, yeah. and Russia halted their military operation, and then Ukraine reneged. Oh yeah, and then so the Russia started their operation up again, yeah. and then um, Zelensky said, "Hey, we're ready for talks, but we're not talking unless you halt your operations." Yeah. And Russia said, "No, forget that. We tried that once. <laughs> yeah, we already we, been there. Yeah, we have worked out that you are just buying time so that you can get more weapons from the West. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to talk." This operation is going to continue while we talk. Yeah, um, and I, I don't, I don't think that actually that's one of those things that I don't think is unreasonable yeah. because the longer this takes, the better position Ukraine is in. Yeah. Well, so I do have a question for you. Okay. Uh, what is Rus Russia's end game here? 
Like, I mean, what what does a victory look like for them? Because I don't quite understand what they expect to gain out of it. There's no way they can occupy Ukraine. I mean, I say there's no way. Yeah. It will be extremely difficult for them to occupy Ukraine. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm honestly not sure. Uh, I th- I think that they really want what they asked for in the beginning. Yeah. Um, which was they want to ensure that uh, that missiles aren't surrounding them. Yeah. Um, that they want to come back to some of these nuclear agreements that we have torn up over the last, you know, twenty years. Yeah. Um, you know, bear in mind, and actually, I think that this is a really important part of this. Yeah. Um, maybe the most important part of this um, is that uh, in two thousand two. Uh, George W. Um, Bush the Younger tore up the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Yeah. All right. Um, and that is one of these sticking points right now is that we have the the uh, anti-ballistic missile emplacements, um, the Aegis emplacements or whatever, the Mark 41, uh, you know, uh, missiles yeah. or missile platforms yeah. in Romania and in Poland. Yeah. Um, and... The problem with those is that they can be refitted yeah. uh, to fire um, thermonuclear tip tomahawk missiles, yeah. among other things. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so that's a problem in and of itself. That puts you know nuclear missiles just minutes away from Moscow. Yeah. And that's a reasonable concern of Vladimir Putin. Oh, absolutely. And because we tore up all these treaties, they can't go inspect them to make sure... That they're not already retrofitted. Right. Yeah. Um, for nuclear missiles. Uh, so, I, you know, this is a, a legitimate concern of his. And, you know, the, the interesting thing um, is that these anti-ballistic missile missiles don't really work. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is all over a, uh, about a technology. Well, not all about a technology, but this yeah. centers around a technology that doesn't even really work. Yeah. But you can't... You can't say you're doing nothing. Well, yeah, but the other thing is that Putin has to has to assume that they do work. Yeah. And if these anti-ballistic missile systems work and they're surrounding Russia with anti-ballistic missile systems, what he's got to consider is that he's being surrounded with anti-ballistic missile systems so that the U.S., who has never promised not to use their uh, nuclear capabilities for a first strike, yeah. can do a first strike and do enough damage to the Russian nuclear arsenal that the anti-ballistic missiles can take care of whatever he's got left in can reserve. Clean up the rest, yeah. And wow. so the U.S. could wipe Russia off. Theoretically, yeah, bomb them into you know. yeah, wipe Russia off the map, and Russia couldn't do anything in response. Yeah. Okay. So he has to take that threat seriously. Yeah. In the same way that he, you know, presented all these new missiles and uh, and other nuclear weapons a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. 2018 or something. I remember in there. that, yeah. Um the uh, had some neat videos. Yeah. Hypersonic <laughs> thing yeah. and um the uh, torpedo that was nuclear powered so that it could just like travel around forever and ever and ever like never find it. Yeah. Um you know, and I, I've gotten some uh some um, assessments of this that like the the hypersonic missiles they that that can't possibly work that yeah. you can't have these hypersonic missiles but we have to assume that he has yeah yeah like exactly. we, we can't we can't say well that's not likely to work and so we can ignore it no no we have to assume that it works yeah. in the same way that he has to assume that these anti-ballistic missiles work yeah exactly and um you know well it's it's probably easier on this side to say, well, of course the U S would never do that. Never would attack Russia unprovoked yeah. just because they could, um, or, or, you know, even if they promised, but Hey, you've lived in this country for this last two years. Do you think that your uh, government is trustworthy? Yeah. How much do you trust your government? <laughs> because I'm telling you right now, they've proved their self incapable time and time again yeah and history uh, you know it it was a war but history shows you that the only country that has ever attacked another country with nuclear weapons is the united states yeah yeah exactly so um and you know depending on what you read uh you may be convinced that the u.s could have avoided uh, attacking um japan with nuclear weapons and still could have ended the war without any real additional casualties yeah but um, that's a discussion for another time or a discussion that we've already had, actually, I think. But, <laughs> Probably. Um, um, but anyway, like, yeah, he has to assume that 
In the same way that the U.S. is assuming the most nefarious motives for, for Vladimir Putin, um, Vladimir Putin has to assume the most nefarious motives for the United States. Yeah. And like I said, I'm not that I'd side with Putin on much, but mm-hmm. I don't trust our government that much. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I'm, yeah, I don't I, trust our government either. Yeah, and so, I live under it, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which probably gives you better reason not to trust. <laughs> and the fact that we've lied to him over and over again. Yeah. And it was a real, like, you know, stick in the face when we tore up the ABM treaty, when yeah. Bush tore up the ABM treaty. Because that was just like months after 9-11, yeah. um, where Vladimir Putin was the first person on the phone saying anything you need. Yeah. And then we're like, okay, well, we want to be able to ring your country with uh, defensive weapons, d- def- you know, quote yeah. unquote defensive weapons. Um, so that you can't uh, attack us, um, and so I'm tearing up this treaty. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, then, of course, uh, Trump tore up the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that kept all of these medium-range nuclear weapons out of Europe. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> now there's nothing to stop him. And, um, and of course, the word was that, that Putin was cheating on it. Yeah. And, you know, there's evidence that he probably was, like around the margins. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. it, what it should have been is an opportunity to for further discussion. To we need to it, negotiate yeah, this to tighten uh, it back up. Exactly. Yeah. Um, instead, you just tear the whole thing to shreds, and yeah. and now we're in a new arms race. Yeah. Or getting there. Getting. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And um, this kind of conflict uh, is just makes it clear how dangerous a world we've created for ourselves by getting out of these treaties. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I don't think that this is going to end up being a, you know, a nuclear war. I don't, I don't think that we really need to worry so much about a nuclear war, but I do think that a nuclear more war is more likely in these kind of situations than without them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why I and think it that just, it's so uh, important to go back as, and talk about the things that the U S did to antagonize and, and provoke um, other countries around the world, but in this case, Russia. Well, and it, it all just seems so unnecessary, especially mm-hmm. the um, as far as provoking Russia. Like, I mean, what do we really stand to gain from that? Even before he in- invaded Ukraine, like what, what, what did we really stand to gain by surrounding his country with all of the stuff? Like, I mean, it's... I, I don't know. I mean, after the Soviet Union broke up, there were a whole bunch of guys that went in there to presumably to help them build up their economic system yeah. um, from the U.S., yeah. uh, some of whom have in later years said, well, actually, what we were trying to do is to make sure that they never got strong again. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, why? Yeah, like, I, I just, <laughs> and so, like, even going back in history, like, why, why do we have this to be so antagonistic towards Russia? Like, I just, I don't, especially given the fact that we're both such strong nuclear nuclear capabilities yeah. it would make more sense for us to just want to find peace yeah well and we and you know like we talked about on the last episode um putin was a very western leaning leader for russia we yeah. had every opportunity to to bring putin into the european fold yeah um or the you know western uh, american and european yeah alliances it, it there was every opportunity to make this a, a strong alliance yeah. um and even the, uh, you know, the reports are um, that even the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty stuff that he was kind of pushing the boundaries of, yeah, it was against China, not against Europe or the U.S. Yeah, um, that he was that they were uh, eastward facing, not westward facing. Yeah, um, and of course, you know, the U.S. is doing the same thing. Yeah, so. You know, there was every opportunity to make Russia more a part of the Western world. Um, and instead, we've pushed Russia uh, more into the Eastern world, to into China's sphere. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and no, I don't, I, I don't entirely understand why, but I think it is just as base as making money for a certain group of people. For yeah. the military-industrial complex, like having this kind of uh, antagonism, yeah. Our antagonistic relationship with a you know quote unquote great power yeah. um, is extremely beneficial. It, well, is, it is for it them. Is, like, it is profit I mean, that's, making. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then of course the there's the uh, U.S. energy um, industry as well that yeah. wants to sell their in- energy to Europe. Yeah. And Russia, Russia offers cheap gas. Yeah. 
Yeah. And if we can take them out of the equation. And that's why the, the Swiss thing is kind of interesting now um, is because they have started removing uh, Russian banks from the SWIFT system. Yeah. Um, which is the the international exchange, uh, like monetary exchange system uh, between banks and so forth yeah. uh, for, you know, transactions, yeah. uh, transactional system, which is mostly controlled by the United States. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've talked many times before about how dangerous that is anyway, because we are using the economy as a, uh, we're using the SWIFT system as a weapon. Yeah. Um, we, you know, cut Iran out of the, the, uh, international economic system. Now we're cutting Russia out of the international economic system. Mm. They have left their exchanges for like Gazprom, I, th I think, and so forth. <laughs> they so, have, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, and, and this is, I think why Switzerland has, has left its neutrality for the first time. Yeah, so in however long, I, I saw it's because about the U.S. That. controls the SWIFT system, yeah. and Switzerland makes its money off of banking. Yeah, and so I imagine that there has been some pressure placed, or at least they see the possibility. Yeah, that if they don't go along with this, yeah, they could end up in trouble. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because I heard about the deal with the Swiss, but I hadn't read anything into it as far as exactly mm -hmm. what was going on there. Yeah. Oh, well, they have, um, you know, cut Russia out of their banking system, essentially. Like, they've yeah. prevented transactions yeah. um, in their way, too. But I, they've, they didn't even do that in World War II. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, Germany was still able to bank in Switzerland yeah. in World War II. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, banking wasn't all electronic at that time. And yeah. there wasn't one superpower that had the ability to turn anybody off. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. To turn whole countries off like yeah. the U S can do now. Yeah. Um, now the other problem for that, uh, of course, in the long term, is that, uh, Europe had already talked about, actually uh, Europe had even set up their own system, but they continue to use swift. Um, China and Russia have both talked about setting up their own, uh, transactional system, international transactional system. Um, I think by continuing to uh, to wield this particular weapon against countries around the world, you're just um, you're accelerating uh, somebody else developing a uh, a competitor. Yeah, another system yeah. that to do the same thing, mm -hmm. and that's something. So I listened to the State of the Union the other night, and something that I took away from it was like. Biden kept talking about isolating Putin, isolating mm -hmm. Putin, and that this as this this was a good thing. Yeah. And and all I could think the whole time he was saying it is like, why is that such a good thing? Like, why do we want to isolate the other major nuclear power? Yeah. Let, on let's this trap planet? the cat in the corner and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, why? Why yeah. would? Why, I mean, what sense does that make? And I mean, maybe other people listening to that. Like rah rah rah, go America! Yeah. But that ain't what I took from it. And well, and this is what I this is what I think most of that is about is Putin can't talk about the economy. Yeah, Putin can't talk about COVID. Yeah, Putin Putin doesn't have anything positive to say. So the best thing he can do in a state of the union right now is to go up there and talk about how terrible Russia is. You mean Biden? You yes. said Putin Did every I time. Putin the whole time? <laughs> you okay. said Putin the whole time. Yeah. I was like, I thought you were going somewhere crazy for a minute. There. I've, I've been talking about Putin the entire episode. So yeah, yeah. yeah Biden. Biden but he can't does, talk you're about right. the he has economy. nothing. This yeah. he has nothing he can really point to that's a win. Mm -hmm. um, but it just, I mean, it came off to me, and maybe other Americans didn't take it the way I took it. Yeah. But because the the media has definitely is rallying around Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, and. So maybe he just maybe everybody else saw it the way he thought he was presenting it as you know this this rally for America. Yeah. I just didn't see it that way. All I saw was man, you're like you're flirting with nuclear war here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, um, I I <laughs> I think I'm about ready to close here unless you've got something no, more. No. I, but there is a little uh, anecdote I, I like to tell. I was talking to one of my mom's um, caregivers. And because uh, she was in um, in the living room, my mom's house, she was watching Fox News. And um, well, actually, she was in the kitchen at this point in time, but she had been in the living room um, and Fox News was on. And they were talking about how we, you know, we have to protect Ukraine and we have to protect Zelensky and 
and so on. And I was wondering, like, how far is this propaganda penetrating, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I asked her, I said, uh, so do you think that the um, U.S. should get involved military to, militarily to protect Ukraine? Yeah. And she said, hell no. Yeah. That ain't got nothing to do with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she went on to say something like, and as far as I can tell, Ukraine been nothing but trouble for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, right on, right on both points. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well said. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that is a great answer. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a great answer. I Oh, uh, the other thing about, like, what does Putin want? Um, I, I think that this is probably worth noting. Uh you remember a while back I was talking about um, why Putin didn't accept um, those uh, two Donbass regions, Donetsk and Luhansk, oh, yes. yeah. um, into Russia after they voted to become part of Russia. Yeah. Uh, and I, I said one of the things I think is that it kind of provided a buffer within Ukraine. You have some pro-Russian people voting in this now democratic um, yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, and that, um, you know, if you take that away, then you've got a country that's overwhelmingly anti-Russian. Yeah. Uh, right there on your border. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and Scott Horton mentioned this in an interview with uh, Judge Napolitano the other day and said that because of this, um, he thinks that Putin may try and take all of Ukraine really? because he can't just take those two provinces because then he's made what's left of Ukraine that much more anti-Russian. Yeah. And still right there on his border. Well, that's a that's a scary thought to me just because it's it's just going to be so difficult for him to to take Ukraine. Yeah. Um and, well, I, and I, to I, hold it. And, well, and to hold it. Well, I mean, yeah. he can take it and it becomes one of those moments where like, I mean, are you going to reign over the ashes because you're going to have to destroy that country mm -hmm. to to take it. Yeah. And then once you take it, it's going to be a fight to maintain it that's going to be pretty perpetual. Well, and you know, and here talking about um just destroying it, like that's the way the news is going, right? Oh, and he's yeah. indiscriminately attacking civilians and so on and so forth. I but do have something to say about that too. Okay. Uh, I think it's what you're fixing to say. Go ahead. Is so I, I consumed a ton of news yesterday. Mm -hmm. And if I saw the same building blow up one more time, I think mm -hmm. I was about ready to blow my brains out. Yeah. Because they kept showing the same footage over and every news. And I was I, like, the reason I watched so much is because I, I got news from everywhere. I went mm -hmm. France 24, BBC, DW, R News. Like I went through the whole gambit. Mm -hmm. um, everything but RT. I don't have RT to, to watch or I would have. Yeah. Um, but I tried to get news from as many sources as I could yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, they all had the same video. Yeah. And it's just like, and so there's a lot of talk about, the, but about, you know, Putin's going to, is just destroying the country right now. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how much truth there is to that, but I do know if he's going to win, he's going to have to. Yeah. Well, and that may be true. Um, the, uh, I think that you can press to a point where there's, negotiations are ready. I, I think that yeah. you would already be past that if you didn't have all these uh, European and um, uh, U.S. powers offering weapons well, yeah. and support to well, Ukraine. And, and, and this is one of the dangers of that. And it's the same thing that happened like um, to the Kurds and, uh, you know, in, in Syria. And, you know, yeah. if you if you're not telling and actually it's probably a big part of why Ukraine got into this mess in the first in place. In the first place, exactly. Is because they felt like they had complete support from the West so they could be antagonistic against Russia. Yeah. yeah. Um that they could, you know, keep poking the bear because they would get support from from Europe um and the US. And if Ukraine had thought itself on its own from the beginning, I imagine they would have been a lot more conciliatory with Russia. Yeah. Well, but um, just using their numbers. So over the weekend, the reports were, well, Ukraine was reporting 400, roughly 400 civilian casualties uh, to that point in the war, like three days in, four days in. Yeah. Um, the U, which already doesn't sound like a whole lot to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, considering, considering it's the, a full scale invasion. Yeah. Um, now the UN was reporting about a hundred at the same time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and of course I don't know whether they're including, um, casualties in the Donbass region that were casualties of the Ukrainian army, not casualties of the Russian army. Yeah. But anyway, um, so then yesterday the numbers I was seeing was, uh, Ukraine was reporting about 2000 civilian casualties. Um, and they had, were also reporting that they had killed 6,000 Russian soldiers. 
Yeah. Now, does that sound like Putin has the scorched earth policy that he's going in there destroying this country if he's lost three times as many soldiers as they've killed civilians in <laughs> yeah. the invasion so far? Yeah. I just, well, th- there's, these there's two things lot, do not line up to me. There's a lot of propaganda at work. Yeah. Um, and, and I do think it goes back to what I said a couple of podcasts ago about Biden's numbers and what you were alluding to with the State of the Union. Mm-hmm. Like Biden has nothing here. Like yeah. this, this is all he's got right now is a distraction, mm-hmm. and and I think that the media and him are using it to the as much of an advantage as they can. Yeah, well, and the you know you talk about twenty years of foreign policy that's led to this, and in nineteen ninety eight, um, NATO started accepting former Soviet or, or former um, uh, Eastern Bloc. Yeah. Uh, republics into NATO. Yeah. Um, and they have continued to accept more and more to the point where there's like 14 members of NATO or something like that now that were former Eastern Bloc countries. Yeah. Um, and they have moved right up to Russia's borders even after promising not to. Oh, absolutely. Um, and... And Ukraine's the line in the sand. I mean, yeah. I, and I don't blame... And he made it very clear for a long time. <laughs> yeah, like this, and this didn't just come up, and this is something I did want to mention before we got out, is that all of this could have been prevented mm-hmm. with us just accepting the fact that that we're not that we're not going to put uh, Ukraine in NATO. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, yes. that's, I mean, all of this could have been avoided at that step. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, we refused to do it for whatever reason. I mean, they had all kinds of re- well, uh, and and Biden. I remember specifically Biden saying, "Well, we're not going to let Russia dictate what what uh, what um, NATO does." It's yeah, like, okay. and, and it was like, "I'm not going to agree to something that I have no intention of doing just because you told me I can't do it." Exactly. Yeah. Like how much? Like how old are we here? <laughs> like uh, that's really like how I yeah. look at it. Like I mean, how old are we? Are we children on totally the playground a yard? Response. Yeah, I mean, come on. Like this is this is. Don't seri- tell me what to do. This is serious. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, we're we're still talking about nuclear powered countries here. Like yeah. I mean, this is a big deal. Yeah. You know. Um, and you know, NATO has always been aligned against Russia. Yeah. And, and that's no secret to anybody, especially Putin. Like Mm -hmm. he understands that, that that this is an organization thrown at his country, Mm -hmm. you know? So. Yeah. uh, I, I, um, I feel like, I, I feel like we just backed him into a corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that finally there wasn't enough is enough. I'm not going to get pushed around anymore. Exactly. And I've got to react. It'll and, be interesting to see how the coming weeks and months play out. And and think of how like he's playing it on his side and how it echoes the way the U S has played some of its invasions over the years too. Yeah. I will not allow Ukraine to become a nuclear power. Yeah. Like we said in Iraq and yep. Iran. I mean, yep. we didn't invade Iran, but, you know, we but invaded we Iraq. Were. Yeah, we did. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I've got to protect my people. Yep. You know, like all of these things that, that he's saying are things that the U.S. has said as an excuse to go into other places. Yeah. Um, and if we can do it, why can't he? Absolutely. You know, yeah. Uh, like uh, it, it, you, you have to um, pay attention to the... Um, one rule for me, another for thee stuff, because people come to resent that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? uh, Whether you're the biggest superpower or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you know, a whole bunch of little dogs can take down a big dog. Well, and that's just it. And I, like I say, I don't really know how China and Russia relations are, mm-hmm. but but a team of China and Russia versus the U.S. is not a good. <laughs> And NATO, don't forget. And NATO, yeah. I mean, yeah, but still, though, <laughs> I'm just saying, man, like it's yeah. that's that's not an alliance we want to to have or mm-hmm. to for them to have. Yeah, you know, yeah, things can get dangerous quick. Mm, certainly have, and you know, so Putin started talking about um, putting uh, nuclear weapons in Belarus, and the West went nuts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, where all does the U.S. Station, it's nuclear weapons. And, yeah. you know, exactly. as far as Putin is concerned, they may already be in Romania and Poland. Yeah, yeah. He can't <laughs> verify that they're not there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, again, this isn't to, this isn't to justify um, what's being done here. But I think there are excuses enough to understand. I, I, I just, I just want people to understand the to, thinking. Yeah. And why it is not irrational for this man to 
react in this way. Yeah. Um, because he's Doesn't been make... lied to over and over again, yeah. and he's been ignored over and over again, and he's been condescended to over and over again, and everything seems to be arrayed against him. And his responsibility is the security of his nation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, uh, you don't have to agree with him, but mm -hmm. you need to at least understand where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of my policy with it. Like you, you need to at least understand the, the things that are at play here and right. the reasons people are doing what they're doing. And try not to make these same mistakes in the future. Exactly. Or this, this is one of those bits of history that will continue to repeat itself. If we continue to act like we can do whatever we want in the world. Exactly. And talk going back to you talking about with the treaties and stuff that we mm -hmm. ripped up and whatnot, um, that may not be a problem for now. Like I don't, I, we're definitely closer to nuclear war now than we were mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago before this started. But I'm not as much worried about now as I am like maybe 10 years from now. Yeah. You know, like down the line after, after all of this has kind of fleshed itself out mm -hmm. and we've opened the door for the next big thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's, I, I don't really feel like this is the time, but I feel like we may be knocking on the door of the big one. Yeah. Well, I think that is very relevant for now um, because what it appears or what, you know, Putin has to assume is that we're tearing up these treaties in preparation for, for an attack. Yeah. In yeah. the same way that like, if you um, are preparing for war with a country, you break off diplomatic ties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe, I mean, it's at any rate, it ain't good. <laughs> it's like, why is the U S suddenly um, removing itself from all of these nuclear forces treaties? Yeah. All these nuclear treaties. Well, maybe yeah. it's because they feel like they can go ahead and take me out. Yeah. Yeah. If they, they weren't a part of these treaties. Yeah. Um, before I can do anything about it. I, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> again, like it's easy to say, well, the U S would never do that. But, um, you know, if you believe in but the just... benevolence of your government, <laughs> then you have not been paying attention. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, all right. Well, it's been about 15 minutes since I said we were going to wrap up. So, uh, <laughs> I guess well, we're going to wrap up. I did just want to give, before we get out of here, as far mm -hmm. as like convention talk, to wrap things up on that note. Sure. Um, a shout out to Anthony Peoples. Oh, yeah. Who stepped down um, from his position that he has served remarkably well at. Yeah. Um, just wanted to give him a bit of a shout out, you know. And to um, Laura Lane for her um, lifetime. Well, oh. It's not... Lifetime achievement. That doesn't seem right. Is that no? It's, <laughs> is that it's what they call it. I forgot what they lifetime call it. Lifetime contributions, contributions or something. Yeah, something like that. But Absolutely. yeah, because um, I'll tell you, she really drugged this party, kicking and screaming to where it's at. Yeah, like I mean, it, <laughs> it has gotten nothing but better since she's gotten involved. Yeah, in the state. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Well, in the county, she's the one oh. that brought us into the us into oh, the county into party. the county party. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. A lot of hard work there. Yeah. So. So, yeah, congratulations to Anthony and to Laura, um, and thanks a lot. Absolutely. So, so um, all right. Well, uh, we, uh, we, you know, we're trying to stay on schedule. I was yeah. actually, like, hoping to get something out earlier, but I... I, I, I it's been a tough week, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a tough week for me, I'm going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've been sick, actually. Like, I've had, yeah. uh, like, real bad stomach pains and so on, so. Um, but, this is about the longest I've been... Upright in two days. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. So, uh, anyway, um, but we, you know, we plan to, to just keep on, keep on going. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, the war has distracted us from other things like Canada and. <laughs> like, oh, man. Yeah. We still haven't talked COVID. about Canada. We talked some. <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. I have some notes somewhere about Canada. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but like yeah. that's going to need a deep dive at some point. Yeah. yeah I so. agree. Um, Maybe yeah. we we may just have to do like a whole banking podcast between the stuff going on in Ukraine and, and the Swift and stuff, the Swift the stuff and the stuff going on in Canada. Yeah. Like we may need to gear up for a banking podcast. So yeah, doesn't hang, that sound exciting? Doesn't that just sound like the most exciting thing ever? Mm. Um, <laughs> and there's some people out there that are like, yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> And it's only those kind of people. No, um, I'm one of those people. Well, like, yeah. I was going to say it's only those kind of people that listen to our podcast to begin with. So. Well, maybe. Uh, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, we plan to be back next week. Um, and uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, 
subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. We actually have an Instagram account, uh, the Liberty Mike at, on Instagram. Yeah. Um, Nothing never there. Never used it, uh, <laughs> but it, it, is a, it, it is available. It exists. Um, <laughs> Uh, kind of feel like there's no point in promoting it in that case. <laughs> if, it's, if there's nothing it, there. Hey, if I notice that there are people following, I might start putting some. Like, we could have put pictures up from this weekend or something. Oh, man, you know? yeah. Like, if, we, if either of us ever took any pictures. My wife took a bunch of pictures at the Afro Man show. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll throw some of those up on the Liberty Mike page. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, follow us. Uh, like and subscribe. Uh, comment, um, share, tell your friends, all those other things that help keep us going Absolutely. and, uh, and give us encouragement to keep on going. Yep. Um, and, uh, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.